But this question of fear, we're all afraid of it. And there are things in relationship to this fear that you and I have to recognize, that if you trust in God and let Him be your guide and strength, you won't have that fear. And your fear is in relationship to your trust. As your faith in God gets stronger, your fear dissipates. And as your faith in God gets weaker, your fear arises. You want to have fear dissipated and removed, then you rise up and hold up the name of the living God and look to Him to undertake for you, and He will. It's our faith that brings victory. It's our faith that casts out fear and enables us to put our trust in the blessed Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We will worship the man of Galilee who went to a cross 2,000 years ago, and no one can take his place. No one will intercede or interfere. We will not permit it. And so it is we have faith without fear. Well, one of the first things I wanted to do when I moved into my house here in Perry almost four years ago, can y'all believe it's been almost four years? Uh, one of the first things I wanted to do was I wanted to build a fence to keep my crazy German Shepherd Dansby contained. And so I went, tractor supply, bought all the materials, got out my work gloves, and I called Ed Ellis because I'm not handy. I do know the difference between a screwdriver and a, and, and a hammer, though. Uh, but I called Ed, and he and Brad Barron came to the rescue, and we built this beautiful fence to keep Dansby contained. That's what it looked like when we first built it. And I knew at the time that my yard was sandy, and that every time it rained, I was losing a little soil to erosion, but I didn't realize just how bad it was until recently I went outside of the fence and noticed this in the corner. Um, so that's not just a pile of leaves. Like, that is where the ground is now in the yard. There's like a foot of difference. And, and it didn't look like that the day after we built it. It didn't look like that in the, in the days or the, even the weeks after, but three and a half years of a little bit of dirt washing down at a time, and that erosion has led to that. And that erosion is the, the perfect picture of moral compromise in life. Uh, it always starts small, maybe one subtle decision that we justify in our minds that it's not a big deal, and then that little compromise makes the next compromise a little bit easier to make and to justify, and then that leads to another and another until over time our character has eroded into a life of failure. And that's what we're going to see in the life of Abraham's nephew, Lot, in our text Today, we've been in this series that we're calling Faith Over Fear, where we're tracking the life of Abraham, who God has called to leave his home and his people, and he's promised to make him into a great and powerful nation. And last week in chapter 17 of Genesis, we saw God confirm that promise to Abraham by promising he and his wife Sarah a child at the age of 99. Abraham is 99 in our text today, and so we pick up the story in chapter 18, if you have your Bibles, Genesis chapter 18. Little to no time has passed between the events that we will read about today and where we left off last week in chapter 17. So although God has revealed more of his covenant promise, Abraham and Sarah are still waiting for the fulfillment of that promise. And I want to do things a little bit different today. Instead of reading the whole text up front and then applying it at the end, I want us to read and apply as we go. And so there will be a lot here. Shout out to the men and women in the sound booth for keeping up because I'm throwing a lot at them today. And so y'all uh, try to keep up. I'm going to go ahead and give you the big idea up front. Commitment to the Lord leads to a life of fullness. Compromise with the world leads to a life of failure. So commitment to the Lord leads to a life of fullness, that abundant life that Jesus promised in, in John chapter 10, verse 10. But a life of compromise um, leads to a life of failure. What we're going to see as we dig into this text are four marks of a life of commitment to the Lord, and then we're going to see in chapter 19 four consequences of a life of compromise with the world. So follow along with me 
In Genesis chapter 18, starting in verse 1, if you're there, say I'm there. The Lord appeared to Abraham near the great trees of Mamre while he was sitting at the entrance to his tent in the heat of the day. Abraham looked up and saw three men standing nearby. When he saw them, he hurried from the entrance of his tent to meet them and bowed low to the ground. So it's siesta time. The morning short, not now, it's not siesta time right now. Y'all stay with me. But in the text, it's siesta time. The morning chores are over. It's the hottest part of the day. Abraham is kicked back at the entrance of his tent to relax for a little bit. And he looks up and he sees three men coming. Now, although we're told in the text that the Lord is among these three visitors, Abraham does not know that. Abraham looks up and he sees three travelers passing by. He does not know that the Lord is among them. Verse 3. He said, if I have found favor in your eyes, my Lord, do not pass your servant by. Let a little water be brought, and then you may all wash your feet and rest under this tree. Let me get you something to eat so you can be refreshed and then go on your way now that you have come to your servant. Very well, they answered. Do as you say. And immediately, siesta time is over. And Abraham and his entire household jump into high gear. Abraham, at 99 years old, is running back and forth, trying to make these guests as comfortable as possible. He runs in, he finds Sarah. He says, Sarah, we've got guests. So so get three large measures of our finest flour and bake some bread. I'm going to go out and pick the best calf and, and start working on some fillets. And in the meantime, can we get a charcuterie board out there to them while they wait? Like, they, he He's doing it up to the best of his ability. They're putting their best foot forward to be hospitable to these travelers. Some suggest that uh, in Abraham, the way he's serving them, he, he realizes already at this point in the story that these aren't just any regular travelers, that there's something honorable about these three guests. But either way, whether Abraham realizes it or not, he's giving his best, the best of his resources, the best of his supplies, the best of himself as he meets every need and stands by. The text says that he stands by to serve them as they eat. The first mark of a life of commitment to the Lord is a life that seeks to serve. The first mark of a life that is committed to the Lord is a life that seeks to serve. Notice Abraham doesn't do this begrudgingly. They don't have to approach him and ask him for his hospitality. No, he goes out of his way to serve them. When the ring doorbell goes off, he doesn't hide. He serves willingly. Whatever whatever Abraham's hands find to do, he does it heartily as if for the Lord, not man. And not realizing it, it is the Lord himself that he is serving. And we should follow suit because we have that same promise. In Colossians chapter 3, it tells us we know that we will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward for like Abraham, it is Christ that we serve when we serve to the best of our ability. So a life that is committed to the Lord is a life that seeks to serve. And then they strike up a conversation. Verse 9. Where's your wife Sarah, they asked. There in the tent, he said. Now Abraham probably thought to himself, that's odd. I never told them my wife's name. And even if, they, even if Abraham did, it's only been days, weeks at most, since her name has been changed from Sarai to Sarah. And so that should be the first clue to Abraham that these are special guests that he's entertaining. Verse 10. Then one of them said, I will surely return to you about this time next year. And Sarah, your wife will have a son. So if Abraham didn't know it was the Lord before, he he knows it now. Because this is the same message, even the same phrasing that was used by the Lord in chapter 17 to confirm this covenant promise to Abraham. Abraham realizes he is dining with the Lord. Now Sarah was listening at the entrance to the tent which was behind him. Abraham and Sarah were already very old and Sarah was past the age of childbearing. So Sarah laughed to herself as she thought, After I am worn out and my Lord is old, will I now have this pleasure? So unlike last week when Abraham laughed at this announcement from the Lord, Sarah's laughter here is not one of amazement, 
but her laughter is in disbelief. And it becomes an opportunity for God to teach the chosen couple a great theological truth about his character. Verse 13, Then the Lord said to Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh and say, Will I really have a child now that I am old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? Some translations say, Is anything impossible for the Lord? I will return to you at the appointed time next year, and Sarah will have a son. Sarah was afraid, so she lied and said, I did not laugh, but he said, yes, you did. So Sarah laughs in disbelief in the quiet recesses of her own mind, and God hears it. This is a lesson in God's omniscience, that there is nothing that God does not see, that there's nothing God does not hear. Hagar learned last week in our text that God sees her. Sarah is learning now that God hears her, even those inner thoughts in her mind. And she passed that knowledge down. The knowledge that she learned of God's omniscience, she passed down through the generations. And her descendant, David, wrote in Psalm 139, You have searched me, Lord, and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. Before a word is on my tongue... You, Lord, know it completely. So for the all-powerful, all-knowing God of the universe, nothing is impossible. And Abraham and Sarah are learning that firsthand. What started out as a meal for three strangers has turned into a covenantal meal with the Lord. This is the only place in Scripture before the incarnation of Jesus where the Lord dines with a human being. And so there's no wonder why Abraham is called a friend of God. Verse 16. When the men got up to leave, they looked down towards Sodom, and Abraham walked along with them to see them on their way. So, so in this text, we see that Abraham serves God, he dines with God, he walks with God, all right here in the first 16 verses of chapter 18. And so the second and probably the most important mark of a life of commitment to the Lord is that a life of commitment to the Lord craves communion. A life of commitment to the Lord craves communion. And I'm not just talking about that sacrament that we just shared together that we do six or seven times a year. I'm talking about an intimacy with the Lord. Abraham's life craved that intimacy with God, to know him personally like a friend. Does your life crave communion with the Lord? Because what we see from Father Abraham is that he is not just the father of a religion. He is the father of a relationship with the God of the universe. Does your life crave communion with with the Lord? Do you desire to experience Him in your quiet time in, in such a way that it, that communion doesn't stop when you close your Bible and move on about your day, but you stay in a constant state of awareness of God's presence? Do you crave that communion? He desires, God desires to not just be your creator, to not just be your sustainer, to not just be your savior. He desires to be your father and your friend for you to be able to know him like Abraham knew him. A life of commitment to the Lord craves that communion. Verse 17. Then the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham what I am about to do? Abraham will surely become a great and powerful nation, and all nations on earth will be blessed through him. For I have chosen him so that he will direct. Listen, this is important. I have chosen him for what? So that he will direct his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing what is right and just so that the Lord will bring about for Abraham what he has promised him. So the third mark of a life of commitment to the Lord is a life that leaves a legacy. A life that leaves a legacy. God is giving us a glimpse into his thought process here. He says, I'm going to tell Abraham what I'm up to because I've chosen him. And I'm, I've chosen him because I know that he will pass on his faith. He will pass on what he learns about me and what I've commanded him. He will pass it on to his children and his children's children after him. He will train them to do what is right and just. That's why God chose Abraham. Verse 20. Then the Lord said, The outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is so great and their sin so grievous 
that I will go down and see if what they have done is as bad as the outcry that has reached me. If not, I will know. So what does this have to do with Abraham leaving a legacy? God foresaw a day when Abraham, with his children, his grandchildren standing beside him, would say, do you see that wasteland over there? It wasn't always that way. There was a time in my life when that wasteland was as lush as the garden of the Lord. Remember that's what Lot said in Genesis chapter 13 when he looked out over the plain where Sodom and Gomorrah was? We know what's about to happen to Sodom and Gomorrah, that God is about to destroy it. And so God foresees a day when Abraham will look out over that wasteland that used to be lush and will use it as a teaching opportunity and say, It wasn't always that way. And that his children, Abraham's children, his grandchildren would look at him and say, Really? What happened, Father Abraham? And he would take that opportunity to tell them about a God who is both merciful and just. That's why God says he will go down to see how bad it is in Sodom and Gomorrah. It's not that God did not know. I mean, we just talked about how God had revealed his omniscience to Abraham and Sarah No, it's not that he he didn't know. God's going down to see was for Abraham's benefit. To show that he does not pass judgments on a whim. That God is a righteous judge. He gathers the facts and he passes righteous judgments. God is revealing to Abraham more and more as we go through and track the life of Abraham. He's revealing who he is. He's revealing who he is and who he's called Abraham and his descendants to be so that they may keep the way of the Lord and do what is right and just. It's about leaving a legacy. I had the honor of officiating the wedding of one of my best friends in the whole world a couple weekends ago. I've known him since he was in the fifth grade. He's the funniest dude you will ever meet. And uh, I had not really gotten to know his fiance all that well. Uh, Our only interactions had been through FaceTime calls where Melissa and I were kind of doing some premarital counseling with them. I don't know why anyone would listen to us after we've only been married for two years. But I got to know her a little bit through through that. And it didn't take me long to realize that that he knew how to pick them, right? That she was a special girl. But I I didn't realize just how incredible until the night of the rehearsal dinner, uh, people were standing up to to toast the, the bride and groom. And... Not just one of her siblings, but every one of her siblings, three of them. And not just her siblings, but even aunts and uncles. They stood up and they said to her, I would not know Jesus the way I know him if it were not for you. God, let that be the testimony of the people of Cross Point. That our co-workers, that our friends, that our children, that our children's children would someday say, I wouldn't know Jesus the way I know him if it were not for you in my life. And so a life of commitment to the Lord is a life that leaves a legacy. Verse 22, the men turned away and went towards Sodom, but Abraham remained standing before the Lord. So it appears that that two of the guests are angels and one is the Lord Jesus himself. And as the two angels head for Sodom, Abraham remained standing before the Lord. Then Abraham approached him, or more literally, he drew near to the Lord. And he said, will you sweep away the righteous with the wicked? What if there are 50 righteous people in the city? Will you really sweep it away and not spare the place for the sake of the 50 righteous people in it? Far be it from you to do such a thing, to kill the righteous with the wicked, treating the righteous and the wicked alike. Far be it from you. Will not the judge of all the earth do right? Who is Abraham to talk to God like that? I'll tell you who he is. He's God's friend. And as God's friend, he knows him. And he knows that he's a righteous Judge, he knows that God is a righteous God. And so unlike when Job questions God in the book of Job, it's not coming from a place of pride from Abraham like it was with Job. It's coming from a place of humility, but it's coming from a place that knows who God is, that knows that he is righteous, that he is just. And God's righteousness 
as an attribute of his character means that all that he does is just. God can't help but be just because he's a righteous God. Abraham knows that and his intercession appeals to that. Verse 26, the Lord said, If I find 50 righteous people in the city of Sodom, I will spare the whole place for their sake. Then Abraham spoke up again. Now that I have been so bold as to speak to the Lord, though I am nothing but dust and ashes, what if the number of the righteous is five less than fifty? Will you destroy the whole city for the lack of five people? If I find forty-five there, he said, I will not destroy it. And on and on it goes. Abraham, this master negotiator, works God all the way down to ten, and God says, for the sake of ten, I will not destroy it. The fourth mark of a life of commitment to the Lord is a life that intercedes compassionately. A life that intercedes compassionately. As Abraham is interceding for the cities on the plain, we see him being conformed to the image of his Lord. That's what's happening right before our eyes. Abraham is being conformed to the image of his Lord. He understands the righteousness of God. He understands the justice of God. And he's beginning to understand that it is God's will that none should perish, but all should come to repentance. His compassionate intercession is a reflection of the heart of the Lord. Do you know that that right now, in this moment, Jesus' present ministry, sitting at the right hand of the Father, is a ministry of intercession for you and me. That right now, Jesus is sitting at God's right hand and he is interceding for you and me. He is praying for you and me before the Father. And so, church, we are never more like Jesus than when we are interceding compassionately for the people in our life. Charles Spurgeon said, If lost sinners will not hear you speak, They cannot prevent your praying. Do they jest at your exhortations? They cannot disturb you at your prayers. Are they far away so that you cannot reach them? Your prayers can reach them. Though they now treat you despitefully, rendering evil for your good, follow them with your prayer. Never let them perish for a lack of your supplications. And so a life of commitment to the Lord intercedes compassionately. Verse 33. When the Lord had finished speaking with Abraham, he left, and Abraham returned home. Follow along with me now in chapter 19. The two angels arrived at Sodom in the evening, and Lot was sitting in the gateway of the city. When he saw them, he got up to meet them and bowed down with his face to the ground. So as Abraham was sitting at the entrance of his tent, when he saw the heavenly contingent coming, Lot is sitting at the entrance to the city when he sees the two angels coming. What the author is doing very quickly here is drawing our attention to some parallels that we're going to notice throughout the rest of these two chapters. What he wants us to do is to compare and contrast the two main characters in the story. Abraham, who is living a life of commitment to the Lord, and Lot, who we can already tell is living a life of compromise with the world. How can we already tell that? Well, the first consequence of a life of compromise is being at home in wickedness. When Abraham and Lot first split up, chapter 13, it said that Lot looked out over the valley, the plain where Sodom and Gomorrah are, and he saw that it was desirable. He saw that it was attractive. And then the text tells us that he pitched his tents near Sodom. And now when we get here, he's living in Sodom. Sodom. First he looked and he saw that it was attractive. Then he moved near it. Now he's at home in it. And that's how compromise works. First we look. We try to justify that there's nothing wrong with a, just a look. And then we move near it and we say, well, I'm not going to participate. I just want to be in proximity to it. I just want to be in the crowd. I'm not going to be of it. I just want to be near it. And then, one compromise leads to another. And finally, let's move into it. We're strong enough to handle it, right? It's like C.S. Lewis warned through his book, The Screwtape Letters. He said, Indeed, the safest road to hell is the gradual one, the gentle slope, 
soft underfoot, without sudden turnings, without milestones, without signposts. A life of compromise is at home in wickedness. Verse 2. My lords, he said, please turn aside to your servant's house. You can wash your feet and spend the night and then go on your way early in the morning. No, they answered, we will spend the night in the square. But he insisted so strongly that they did go with him and entered his house. He prepared a meal for them, baking bread without yeast, and they ate. Before they had gone to bed, all the men from every part of the city of Sodom, both young and old, surrounded the house. They called to Lot, Where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them out so that we can have sex with them. Now let's pause and let's talk for a moment about the wickedness of Sodom because there's more to it than just what we see here in this text. Yes, one of the major sins in Sodom was a violent sexual perversion. And the author shows the comprehensive nature of the city's wickedness in, in that all the men, notice, all the men, both young and old, he's painting this comprehensive picture of just how wicked Sodom is, that all of the men are ready to commit this sin. But the depth of their wickedness is actually much deeper than that. Listen to what it says in Ezekiel chapter 16, verse 49. Behold, this was the guilt of your sister Sodom. She and her daughters had pride, excess food, and prosperous ease, but did not aid the poor and needy. So we want to be so quick when we read this to say, Oh God, wipe them off the face of the earth because they were so sexually perverse. When that was just a symptom. That was just part of the bigger issue of pride, of lust, of of laziness, of a, a complete neglect of the poor. that the, the people of Sodom were getting fat and happy and were ignoring the poor and needy. That was the outcry that had risen up to God against Sodom. Verse 6. Lot went outside to meet them and shut the door behind him and said, No, my friends, don't do this wicked thing. Look, I have two daughters who have never slept with a man. Let me bring them out to you and you can do what you like with them. But don't do anything to these men, for they have come under the protection of my roof. Now, even in a culture where hospitality was the, of the utmost importance, and when you took a guest into your home, you were responsible for their well-being. Even in that culture, what Lot is suggesting is wicked, and it's wrong. Lot has gone too far. Verse 9. Get out of our way, they replied. This fellow came here as a foreigner, and now he wants to play the judge? We'll treat you worse than them. And so the second consequence of a life of compromise is the loss of public witness. The loss of public witness. Now, remember, when we first saw Lot in this text, where was he? He was sitting at the city gate. Who sits at the city gate in the ancient Near East? It was the civic leaders. It was the people of prominence in a city that sat at the city gate. And so although they accuse him here of being a foreigner, the reality was that Lot was a major player in Sodom. He stood out too much to fit in, but he had fit in too much to stand out. I'm going to say that again. He stood out too much to fit in, but he had fit in too much to stand out as a faithful witness to what was right. Kent Hughes says, while there is certainly nothing wrong with gaining influence in a city full of sinners, in fact, we should aim to do this more today, nothing in this text indicates that Lot was working to reform the city for the kingdom of God. You know, I often wonder, why did Abraham stop in his negotiations with God at ten righteous people? Why not go on down to, to five? Why not go on down to four, since that was how big Lot's family was? But I think that Maybe Abraham stopped at 10 because he thought, well, surely by now, Lot has won six people to the Lord. But compromising Lot has lost his public witness. It says they kept bringing pressure on Lot and moved forward to break down the door. Verse 10, but the men inside reached out and pulled Lot back in the house and shut the door. Then they struck the men who were at the door of the house, young and old with blindness, so that they could not find the door. The two men said to Lot, Do you have anyone else here, sons-in-law, sons or daughters, or anyone else in the city who belongs to you? Get them out of here, because we are going to destroy this place. 
The outcry to the Lord against its people is so great that he has sent us to destroy it. So Lot went out and spoke to his sons-in-law, who were pledged to marry his daughters. He said, hurry and get out of this place because the Lord is about to destroy the city. But his sons-in-law thought he was joking. The third consequence of a life of compromise is the loss of influence at home. Now, ancient Near Eastern betrothals were uh, a lot more binding than our modern day engagements. They typically lasted at least 12 months and, and it was so binding that they had really become family at this point. They had become so much family to Lot that he left the, the security and the safety of the presence of the two angels. He was willing to leave that and put himself in harm's way to go out and warn them of God's coming judgment. But these two men had not seen enough of Lot's God in him or heard enough of Lot's God from him to believe in the coming judgment. And so they laughed in his face. Could it be that all those little compromises in Lot's life had caused his family not to take his God very serious? This would explain why although they were warned not to look back when they fled Sodom, Lot's wife did look back, and spoiler alert, if you've never read the story, she becomes a pillar of salt. The Bible indicates that it wasn't just a curious glance, but that Lot's wife looked back and longed for Sodom. Jesus used it as an illustration in Luke chapter 17, verse 32. He said, remember Lot's wife? Whoever tries to keep their life will lose it, and whoever loses their life will preserve it. While Abraham's family left a life of legacy, of love for the Lord, the legacy that Lot's family left was one of love for the world. Because of the compromises Lot had made, he lost his influence at home. Verse 15. With the coming of dawn, the angels urged Lot, saying, Hurry, take your wife and your two daughters who are here, or you will be swept away when the city is punished. When he hesitated... The men grasped his hand and the hands of his wife and his two daughters and led them safely out of the city, for the Lord was merciful to them. The fourth consequence of a life of compromise is that a life of compromise lacks the urgency to obey. Even as he was being dragged out of a city that was destined for destruction, Lot hesitated. He lacked the urgency to obey. He tried to negotiate with the angels about where he was fleeing to. He said, I know the city is about to be destroyed and i got to get out of here. And I know you're telling me that I need to run away to the mountains. But can I at least run away to the small city nearby? It's almost like Lot is saying, can I at least ha have a little wickedness in my life? First Lot lingered, then he argued, and then he begged to be allowed to go his own way. He should have been grateful for God's mercy, but instead he lacked the urgency to obey. My parents used to say all the time when I was growing up, delayed obedience is disobedience. Delayed obedience is disobedience. And I knew they were talking to my siblings, but I still, <laughs> I still got it. Lot, unfortunately, did not get that message. And yet God still spared him. Matter of fact, God spared the entire wicked town that Lot ran to because of his mercy and because of Abraham's intercession. But what happened to Sodom, verse 23? By the time Lot reached Zoar, the sun had risen over the land. Then the Lord rained down burning sulfur on Sodom and Gomorrah from the Lord out of the heavens. Thus he overthrew those cities and the entire plain, destroying all those living in the cities and also the vegetation in the land. And so Abraham wanted to know, will not the judge of all the earth do right? The answer is a resounding yes. God judged these cities because of the unrepentant wickedness, but in his mercy, he spared righteous Lot. Now, whoa, 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 wait a minute. Righteous Lot? I know, I was just as shocked 
as you are, that after all the terrible compromises that we see Lot make in this text, he is still called righteous. Listen to what it says in 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 7 and 8. And if he rescued Lot, a righteous man, who was distressed by the depraved conduct of the lawless, for that righteous man living among them day after day was tormented in his righteous soul. Peter wants us to be sure we don't miss the fact that Lot was righteous. And when I read that this week, church, I was honestly angry. I was angry when I read that. I said, God, you mean to tell me that the guy who made his home in Sodom the guy who offered his daughters up to rapist, the guy who lacked all urgency to obey you. Oh, and we didn't even get to the end of chapter 19 where he has this incestuous incident with his own daughters. And despite all of that wickedness that we see in Lot, your word still declared him righteous. Lord, that's not fair. You should have left that sick man to the fate he deserved. And then I heard the Holy Spirit say, what about you? Should I have left you to the fate you deserved? For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So no, God is not fair. And I'm so glad he isn't. Because if God were fair, it would be you and I hanging on that cross not the sinless Son of God who died in our place. There was only one way that Lot could have been righteous. And it's by the same means that Abraham was declared righteous in chapter 15. And it's by the same way that you and I are declared righteous. And it's by faith. Not by works. By faith. And I'm afraid what some of you take when you hear that is, oh, well, if Lot made it, then I guess I don't have to be too committed to the Lord. To quote Kent Hughes again, the life of Lot shows us that it is possible to have a saved soul and a wasted life. Lot would be rescued, but his life would accomplish nothing. How did he get there? How did he get to that life of failure? Compromise. One little compromise after another. Do you really want to live that way? Compromising with the world and missing out on the life that Jesus died for you to live. That's a miserable way to spend the breath that God has placed in your lungs. David Guzik said, and this is the best quote that I've seen in all my study about the life of Lot. Here's what he says. Lot was in the worst of all places. He had too much of the world to be happy in the Lord and too much of the Lord to be happy in the world. And I'm afraid that describes so many Christians today. And that's a miserable way to live. To live with too much of the world to be happy in the Lord and too much of the Lord to be happy in the world. It's like we know there is this angst in us. We know life isn't what it is supposed to be. We know that there's this brokenness and, and we are so okay with making these compromises with the world. And, and, and we're created with this God-sized hole in our heart that only Jesus can fill. And so we know that there is something that's not right. But we want what the world has to offer. We, like Lot, we look and we see that it is attractive and then we move near it and then we find ourselves in it because one compromise after another. Don't live that way. Don't live with too much of the world to be happy in the Lord and too much of the Lord to be happy in the world. Commit your life to Christ. Commit your life to to Christ. Give him everything you've got because then and only then will you find that fullness of life that he promised. That abundant life is only found in an intimacy with Jesus. So commit your life to him. Seek to serve. Crave communion. Leave a legacy 
intercede compassionately for the lost. That is the life that you were meant to live for the glory of God. Is God fair? No, but he is just. And as a just God, sin has to be punished. And so Jesus stepped down from his throne in heaven and he took our place and he died the death that we deserve to die so that through faith in him, we might experience the fullness of life. Commit your life to him. Then and only then will your soul be satisfied. Commit your life to him. Do you know him? If you don't know him, I pray today would be the day. Pastor Michael and I, Pastor Cleve, will be standing down front. We would love to talk to you about what it would look like for you to surrender your life, to take that next step, commit your life to the Lord, and find the fullness of life that is only found in him. Heavenly Father, we love you. God, we thank you for your love for us. God, we thank you for the privilege it is to be in your house, to gather with your people and to to dig into your word. God, I thank you for the truth that your word has revealed today. And Father, I pray for the grace to commit our life to you, for the grace to say no to compromise. God, that we would give all that we have to you. Because Jesus, you paid it all. All to you we owe. Father, help us walk out this truth. We love you, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.